Hi, and welcome to Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I'm Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Welcome to the show. This episode of my podcast is a question and answer show. A while ago, I did one of these and it proved fairly popular. So because I'm having a difficult time coming up with a topic for this week, I thought this would be a fun change of pace. But as usual, I need to start by taking a minute to thank some pretty special people. It's been a couple of episodes since I did a shout out and you all deserve one. So here we go. I would like to start by welcoming Taylor as the newest member of the Thank You Club. Thank you, Taylor. Also, Sarah C., Michelle T., Melissa S., Megan B., Christine T., Mary W., Donna K., Robert R., Lara L., Stacy L., Kathy K., Katie F., Rachel H., Diane B., Joy B., Lynn J., James V., Rachel D., Lacey W., Angela P., Azaria J., Alithia B., Ann L., Cynthia R., Lisa N., Stacy O., Nora C., Wendy A., Catherine R., Carrie H., Jen D, Cheryl T, Mary T, Nicole T, Tanya R, Melissa C, and Heather T from Renaissance English History Podcast. You too can show your support by going to patreon.com slash tutors dynasty. Just click become a patron and for as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. Okay, let's get on with the show. That's what you came here for, right? (laughs) We'll start with our first question. A follower asked, is it documented why Henry never let his daughter Mary get married while he was alive? There was no question about the person that I needed to ask about this question. Melita Thomas is the author of The King's Pearl, Henry VIII and his daughter Mary. If you're interested in learning about Queen Mary I in her life, then I would highly recommend that you buy or borrow this book. You might just learn something new. So again, the question, is it documented why Henry VIII never let his daughter Mary get married while he was alive? Melita said, there were numerous negotiations and three betrothals in her childhood. Later, although negotiations continued, the other parties always wanted her declared legitimate and next in line after Edward. Henry would only agree that she could inherit after any legitimate, in his view, sons and daughters. I think also that he was worried that if she were married to a man who commanded an army, she might be a threat to Edward. The next question comes from Christine. Christine asks, I'm interested in Henry VIII's group of friends, how they became close to him, their backgrounds, and what friendship with Henry would have been like. I've read about how he had his guy friends, especially when he was a young man with whom he hunted and played sports. So I'm curious how they became friends with him and how those friendships played out over the years. We hear a lot about Charles Brandon, but only bits and pieces about the others. Christine, this is a big question, and I'll have to do a bunch of research to find all the appropriate answers for you, and unfortunately, I did not have enough time this week to do so. But I do know that Charles Brandon practically grew up at court with Henry since his father was the standard bearer for King Henry VII. I do assume that the rest of them met the future king through their parents' appointments as well. Sir William Compton, I found, did become a ward of Henry VII after the death of his father in 1493. Compton was then appointed by Henry VII to be a page to Prince Henry, who was then Duke of York. He was about nine years older than Henry, but the two became close friends. But that's all I have for now. Like I said, I'll have to put this in queue as a future article idea because there's a lot to be told here. Our next question is from James. Is it true that Elizabeth I feared death so much that near the end she would not sit down or go to sleep in fear of never waking back up? This has always struck a chord with me as it's almost symbolic as an end to a dynasty that her death would signal. Almost like with her reluctance, she knew or even regretted not trying to continue it. Well, James, I found mention of this in a book by Paul Johnson called Elizabeth I, A Study in Power and Intellect. If he owned the book, on page 436, it says Manningham, I presume he refers to John Manningham, who was an English lawyer and diarist, had dinner with Elizabeth's favorite chaplain, Dr. Perry, and three other senior clerics. They told him that, quote, that her majesty hath been by fits troubled with melancholy some three or four months, but for this fortnight extreme oppressed with it, insomuch that she refused to eat anything, to receive any physic, 
or admit any rest in bed till within these two or three days. She hath been in a matter speechless for two days, very pensive and silent, since shrove tide, sitting sometimes with her eyes fixed upon one object many hours together, yet she always had her perfect sense and memory. In Alison Ware's book, The Life of Elizabeth I, she also reiterates the statement with more specificity. On page 482, Ware also mentions on the previous page that Nottingham tried also to get her to retire to bed, but she refused, telling him, If you were in the habit of seeing such things in your bed as I do when in mine, you would not persuade me to go there. She added that she had a premonition that if she once lay down, she would never rise. Also, if you own the book, turn to page 483, and there's a quote, At last on the 21st of March, What by fair means, what by force, Nottingham persuaded Elizabeth to go to bed. Elizabeth died the following day. Heather asks, Arthur Dudley, who washed ashore and claimed to be the child of Elizabeth and Robert Dudley, is there any reliable proof of? What's the full story there? Okay, so this topic is one that I haven't really studied yet. So I did find an article on the AnneBoleynFiles.com by art historian and novelist Melanie Taylor. In the article, she says that over the centuries, the debate about a possible royal bastard has continued, and it seems unbelievable that the Queen of England might have hidden a pregnancy from the court. During 1561, it was observed that Elizabeth suffered from dropsy and swelled and was evidently unwell during the year. Now, there is so much more that's going to go into answering this question about Arthur Dudley that, again, I am going to have to add this one to the list of possible article ideas for the future because there is so much to cover with him. Whether he really was the son or wasn't the son, that will be up to a future article. We'll write a little bit more about that later. Kim asked the question, who killed the boys in the tower? (laughs) Kim, I'm not going to poke that beehive and I'm going to leave that one alone because obviously we don't really know the answer and everybody's got an opinion and it just makes people upset. So I am not answering that one. But thank you, Kim, for the question. This next question is about Anne Boleyn. What can you tell me about Anne's supposed extra finger or fingernail? Is there any truth to it and where did the story originate? So for this question, Claire Ridgway is the owner of the AnneBoleynFiles.com and author of several Tudor era books. Now, the Anne Boleyn Files was the first Tudor website that I really started making a point of visiting every day. This website I even subscribed to because I didn't want to miss any of Claire's new posts. I figured Claire would be the best person to answer this question about Anne Boleyn. So with that, what can you tell me about Anne's supposed extra finger or fingernail? Is there any truth to it? And where did the story originate from? Claire said it originates with Nicholas Sander writing in Elizabeth the first reign. And there is no contemporary evidence for Anne having anything wrong with her fingers or hands. Sanders also wrote of Anne having a projecting tooth and a wen. Now, I'll have a link to Claire's article about this um, sometime soon so that you can read a little bit more about the about the Nicholas Sanders conversation. Now, what about the extra finger? Claire says, well, although an extra finger is not mentioned by any contemporary source, George Wyatt writes, there was found indeed upon the side of her nail upon one of her fingers, some little show of a nail, which yet was so small. But the report of those that have seen her as the workmasters seem to leave it an occasion of greater grace to her hand, which with the tip of one of her other finger might be and was usually by her hidden without any least blemish to it. He goes on to say that Anne had certain small moles, but goes on to write of her bright beams of beauty and rare admirable beauty. Wyatt obviously saw this little show of a nail as very minor, and it is far from an extra finger. The extra finger is definitely a big Boleyn myth. Wyatt makes absolutely no mention of a win or projecting tooth, although Wyatt was not a contemporary of Anne Boleyn. He explains in his biography that his information came from a lady who attended on Anne before and after she was queen thought to be Anne Gainsford, and a lady of noble birth living in those times and well acquainted with the persons that most this concerneth, for whom I am myself descended, so people who knew Anne. The next question from Heidi. Do you know if Jasper Tudor was ever married to someone other than Catherine Woodfill? Well, the first person that came to mind to answer a question about Jasper Tudor was author Tony Riches. Riches is the author of many fantastic Tudor-themed books, including the Tudor Trilogy, three books, Owen, Jasper, and Henry. 
Most recently, he released a book about Mary Tudor, sister to Henry VIII and Queen of France. All of his books are fantastic reads. But of course, for this question, I thought Tony would be perfect to answer a specific question about Jasper. So, do you know if Jasper Tudor was ever married to someone other than Catherine Woodville? Riches says Jasper was only married to Catherine, and it didn't go well as Jasper died in December 1495 without leaving Catherine anything in his will. And Catherine married Richard Wingfield as soon as she could. There is much speculation about Jasper's mistresses, but he didn't marry any of them. The next question I have is a big one. This is one that comes up in conversations quite frequently in the Tudor circles. Did Henry VIII have syphilis? If you haven't checked out Pustules, Pestilence, and Pain, Tudor Treatments and Ailments of Henry VIII, you really must, and soon. And please forgive me if I'm completely slaughtering his name, but our author Seamus O. Sile was a no-brainer for this question. Seamus, did Henry have syphilis? He says, the medical records of Henry VIII have never been found and likely do not exist. However, we can look at the letters to and from his court to piece together the ailments that Henry had. The main reason that people have speculated that Henry had syphilis are the personality changes Henry had later in life. The amount of infant death and stillborn babies his wives had, and he had a bunch of mistresses. First of all, comparing Henry's number of mistresses to other kings of the time, he had a few. Not that you cannot contract syphilis from a single encounter, but statistically he had less mistresses than his peers and so was less likely to contract it than them. His personality changes are more likely caused by the jousting accident, having out of control sugar levels, chronic pain, stress, and lead poisoning. We have records of all of the items bought for his houses and the form of mercury used to treat syphilis has never been found. Finally, the stillbirths and marriages, it is more likely that Henry had RH plus blood and his wives had RH negative or some other sort of issue. There are letters about Henry's bowel movements. I'm sure there would have been a letter about a visible condition like syphilis somewhere in the talk of court. While syphilis is not always visible, like when it goes into the latent stage, previous to that it would have gone through the first two stages and I believe someone would have noticed. To conclude, we don't know that he didn't have syphilis, but the evidence is strong that he didn't. And that's what I believe. Thank you, Seamus. The next question is, at what age was Anne Boleyn sent to Michelin to further her education? Author Natalia Richards of Falcon's Rise, The Early Years of Anne Boleyn, seemed like the right person to go to about the early years of Anne. If you love Anne Boleyn, like a majority of you do, but, you know, don't forget we did vote on it and she did win, <laughs> then you need to read this book. You will not be disappointed. So at what age was Anne Boleyn sent to Michelin to further her education? Natalia said, Anne was sent when she was 13. She was sent as a demoiselle, which meant basically that she was there to learn how to be a lady-in-waiting. She would have attended Margaret with the other young girls, learn to converse intelligently, dance, play music, sew, and read worthwhile books. Duties as such would have been light, one of companionship and being decorative. Some schooling may have continued, and I expect she would have continued to learn French. Whether or not she studied with the royal children in the schoolroom is debatable. She would have been taught to be useful to her mistress and how to be confident talking to ambassadors, etc. It may only have been small talk, but she would be expected to do this. She would have watched the other ladies to see how they behaved, dressed, etc. to be pleasing and modest. Religious instruction would have been very important, far more than it is today, for the world revolved around the Catholic Church, its rituals, and festivals. The next question is about Mary Tudor, sister of Henry VIII, not his daughter. How did Mary's motto, the will of God is sufficient for me, affect her decision making in life? I'm currently working on Lorraine Blanche by the author Sarah Bryson. So far I can tell, Bryson did a thorough job researching the life of Mary Tudor and the evidence left behind. So for this question, I knew she would be my go-to person. So, how did Mary's motto, the will of God is sufficient for me, affect her decision making in life? Sarah says, Logically, when you think about it, Mary was Catholic and very devout to her religion and her faith. However, really, she took much of her life into her own hands. Maybe she thought it was God's will that she marry whom she choose for a second time. After all, Henry had promised. Bryson goes on to explain that Mary had a fierce independence, and that is proven when she married Charles Brandon in France. 
Mary took responsibility for her actions and put all the blame upon herself. She was risking a lot by doing so, but she did it anyway. The next question, Catherine of Aragon showed the world her strength during the king's great matter. Where do you believe she got that strength from? If you haven't read Falling Pomegranate Seeds by Wendy J. Dunn, you must go get it now. I know many of you love to learn more about Catherine. This book is well-researched and it's a great read. I'm so glad that I read it and it taught me so much about the early years leading up to her departure to England. So our question for Wendy was... Catherine of Aragon showed the world her strength during the king's great matter. Where do you believe she got that strength from? Wendy said, Catherine always had strength of character, but it was the king's great matter which really pushed her to show history her true self. Before the great matter threatened her marriage, she saw her roles as that of Henry VIII's loyal and supportive wife and that of being the Queen of England. She was beloved of the English because she was a good queen who wanted the best for her adoptive country. The long years of her marriage saw Catherine cleverly achieving many of her own goals, but she also knew when to withdraw and give her husband victory. The gray matter was a different matter entirely. She was the proud daughter of Isabel of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon, a royal princess twice over. Henry VIII's desire for her to step aside so he could marry again was a slap in the face to her very identity. More than that, with Henry now saying that their marriage had been no marriage at all, I believe she feared for Henry VIII's soul. The Tudors lived in a time when the existence of God was rarely questioned. Belief in God shaped their very lives. From the time she was born, Catherine was brought to serve God with devotion. I believe that many personal tragedies in her life deepened her faith. She believed we never come to the kingdom of heaven but by troubles. She also believed in listening to her conscience. Where did her strength come from? I believe it came from her own character, her strong faith in God, and her belief that she was right and Henry was wrong. Sheila asked, was Anne of Cleves really miserable or okay with Henry's divorce? Historian Heather Darcy is currently working on a book about the life of Anne of Cleves. A biography about Anne of Cleves told from a more German perspective. Her book has the working title of Anna, Duchess of Cleves, the King's Beloved Sister. It has an anticipated release date through Amberley Publishing of Spring 2019. It will be available first in the UK, however. Heather seemed like the perfect person to have the inside scoop on the life of Anne of Cleves. So, Heather, was Anne of Cleves really miserable, or was she okay with Henry's divorce? Darcy says that she has her own theories. She says that the theories are based on the overall arc of her book, and not on any letters, and such written by Anna. It is anyone's guess how she felt. Anne was dignified, gentle, gracious woman. She was also smart. She learned English in less than six months. Yes, she still had her counselors to help translate, but wouldn't anyone want someone to translate such an important, serious matter? Anyway, Anna would never have publicly made her feelings known and would have always projected positivity from what I can tell. Thank you, Heather. Now we got another question for Heather about Anne of Cleves. Did Anne really believe that kissing constituted sex? Heather says, no, I do not believe that Anna believed that kissing constituted sex. To put it into context, the Queen of England was being asked by a servant whether she was having intercourse with her husband, the King of England. What flagrant boldness of a mere servant to ask the Queen of England such a question. There is no reason to believe that Anna, a 24-year-old woman, did not understand the purpose of her vagina. If anything, Anna's response shows what a gracious and gentle woman she was. Her servant, even if the servant was a member of the peerage, was asking an invasive question. Anna gently put her in her place and possibly made the woman feel sheepish when Anna gave her response about whether kissing Henry was enough. Another question about Anne of Cleves. Did Anne have a secret child by Henry VIII? Heather says, no, I do not believe Anne ever had any children by Henry. Some analysis of the rumor suggested that Henry allegedly impregnated Anna in August 1541 when he visited her in Richmond. The rumor came to the court's attention possibly as early as October 1541 and was investigated by early December 1541. Anna would have conceived the baby at the time when Henry was married and presumably still in love with Catherine Howard before the Northern Progress in autumn of 1541. Why would she risk becoming pregnant with a bastard, even if it were a royal one, and at a time when all things pointed to Henry being quite content with the youthful Catherine Howard? 
Generally speaking, such a thing would have likely ruined the 26-year-old. Anna's prospects at making a suitable match in the future, and especially if she had hoped to make a match on the continent. She was, after all, still the born Duchess of Cleves in her own right, and a valuable potential bride. Turning back to Anne being impregnated in August of 1541, it could have put Anna in danger of her person, depending on how Queen Catherine would have responded to Anne's pregnancy, again assuming the child was conceived around August 1541 before there was trouble between Henry and Catherine. Why would Anne ever risk it? Darcy also mentioned that her book will cover the rumor and many other fascinating facts about Anne of Cleves. So with that, there were a few of your questions um, that I wasn't able to get to at this time. But don't fret, I have saved them for another time. Thank you so much again for joining me for this week's Tudor's Dynasty podcast. I hope you enjoyed our question and answer episode. Until next time. <music>